Hi, everyone. I'm Dan Fullerton, and today I want to talk to you about orbits and Kepler's laws of planetary motion. Our objectives for today are going to be to state Kepler's laws of planetary motion and use them to describe the motion of an object in orbit, to apply conservation of angular momentum to determine the velocity and radial distance at any point in orbit, and finally to apply energy conservation in analyzing the motion of an object projected straight up from the surface of a planet or straight down to the surface of a planet. So let's start out by talking about circular orbits. If we have over here a mass m2 traveling in a circular orbit of radius r about mass m1 with angular velocity omega and tangential velocity v, what's keeping it in circular orbit? Well, gravity must be causing the centripetal force on the object. Therefore, we can use Newton's second law of motion to solve for the velocity of the satellite, m2. Let's do that by starting off by writing Newton's second law, f net c equals mac for an object traveling in a circular orbit. And we know that that has to be caused by the force of gravity. Now we also know, using Newton's law of universal gravitation, that the magnitude of the force of gravity must be g m1 m2 over r squared, and we also know that AC is going to be equal to V squared over R. So rearranging this a little bit, the left hand side we have M times our AC V squared over R. And that must be equal to our force of gravity G M1 M2 over r squared. All right, couple simplifications I can make right away. This is our orbiting mass. That's our orbiting mass, m2. Those can make a ratio of 1. And if I multiply both sides by r, that goes away. And I'm left with v squared equal to g m1 over r. Or if I want just the velocity, that'll be the square root of g m1 over r. So there's the velocity for an object in circular orbit. And note that there is no dependency on the mass of the satellite of the orbiting object, only a dependency on the mass of the central object and the radius, the distance from the center of the objects to the center of the other object. All right, let's go and take a look at the period and frequency for circular orbits. Period is the time it takes for the satellite to make one complete revolution or one complete circumference of its circular path. And we can solve for that using the velocity that we just previously discovered. And once we have that, frequency is just one over the period. So that's kind of a no-brainer. To start this analysis, to find the period, we're going to begin by saying that the distance it travels in one complete orbit must be 2 pi r. And that's also equal to the distance traveled, v, the velocity, times the time it takes for one complete orbit, the period. Right away, you can see that we can start solving for the period t equals 2 pi r over the velocity. But we just learned that the velocity is the square root of g m1 over r. So I can rewrite this now as t equals 2 pi r divided by v. But v is the square root of g m1 over r. Or with a little bit of algebraic rearrangement, that's 2 pi r over, we've got square root of g m1 square root of r. That looks just a little bit awkward, so why don't I square both sides, square t and square the right-hand side to make this a little bit easier to comprehend. And we'll write this, the left-hand side, t squared is just t squared, of course. Right-hand side, I get 4 pi squared. I've got r squared times r. That'll be r cubed over g m1. That's actually Kepler's third law of planetary motion for a circular orbit. And if we wanted to, we could take the ratio of t squared divided by the radius cubed. That's going to give us 4 
pi squared over g m1. That's known as Kepler's constant. It's roughly the same for all the planets in our universe, and it's somewhere near 3 times 10 to the minus 19 seconds squared per meter cubed. Not overly important to know that exact value for now. Let's keep going in our analysis. Let's look at the total mechanical energy for a circular orbit. Total mechanical energy, if you recall, is the sum of the kinetic plus the potential energy. And if we're doing this for our orbiting body, we of course know that the kinetic energy is just going to be 1 half m2 v squared. And our potential energy due to gravity is minus g m1 m2 over our radius. Therefore, our total energy is going to be equal to our kinetic 1 half m2 v squared plus our potential minus g m1 m2 over r. Now, since we just found our velocity for an object in circular orbit, remember that velocity is the square root of g m1 over r. Therefore, the square of velocity must be g m1 over r without the square root. We can take that value for velocity squared and substitute it in over there. When we do that, I get that our total energy equals 1 half m2. Now, v squared we replace with g m1 over r. And we still have this term from the potential, gravitational potential energy, g m1 m2 over r. Let me just take a minute to rewrite that. That's going to be g m1 m2 over 2r minus g m1 m2 over r. All right, now we can just do a little bit of algebra then to say that the total mechanical energy, g m1 m2 over 2r minus g m1 m2 over r, is just going to be minus g m1 m2 over 2r. There's the total mechanical energy for our object in a circular orbit. All right, one last thing to look at here with circular orbits. Let's explore escape velocity. Escape velocity is the velocity required to completely escape the influence of gravity. It occurs when you're an infinite distance from a mass, so you can't ever really get there. But this gives us an idea of what sort of velocity you would need to get close, to escape the influence, practically, of an object's gravitational field. We can find it by recognizing that the gravitational potential energy has to be zero when you've escaped its gravitational field, and it has no leftover kinetic energy. So the kinetic energy, or its velocity at that point, is going to be zero. So we'll start with that understanding. Total mechanical energy, kinetic plus potential again, in this case, when you hit the condition of escape velocity, is going to be zero. Therefore, we could write that zero is going to be equal to one half m2 v squared minus g m1 m2 over r. Now, all we have to do is solve this for the velocity. So right away, I'm going to add g m1 m2 over r to both sides to say that one half m2 v squared must equal g m1 m2 over r. And if I divide both sides by m2 and multiply both sides by 2, I find out then that v squared equals 2 g m1 over r. Or if I want just v, and this is going to be the escape velocity at this condition, that's going to be the square root of 2g m1 over r. Escape velocity for a circular orbit. All right, so now let's take a look at elliptical orbits, but realize that most of the orbits we deal with are pretty near circular, even if they are slightly elliptical. And we're going to do this from the lens of Kepler's laws of planetary motion. So his first law of planetary motion states that the orbits of planetary bodies are ellipses, 
with the sun as one of the two foci of the ellipse. Okay, so they're elliptical orbits. The sun's one of the two foci. Second law says that if we were to draw a line from the sun to the orbiting body, here's our sun, line from the orbiting body, it'll sweep out some area in an amount of time, that green area. And if we do that again somewhere else, as long as those areas are equal, as long as area one is equal to area two, the green equals the blue, then if that happens, we know that that occurs in the same amount of time, a way for us to start looking at velocity versus position for an elliptical orbit. And Kepler's third law of planetary motion, to do this we need to talk a little bit about the geometry of an ellipse. If we take a line from the center of the ellipse, to the edge of the ellipse over here at the perigee point, the furthest distance, we call that the semi-major axis, or A. Now, oops, pardon me, perigee, apogee point. Apogee is the farthest point from the center, from the, uh, from the sun. Perigee is the closest point. But if you take the long distance across the ellipse, the long, almost a radius of the ellipse compared to the short radius of the ellipse, we're talking about the semi-major axis. When you do this, the ratio of the squares of the periods of the planets is equal to the ratio of the cubes of their semi-major axes. Or like we derived earlier for a circular orbit, t squared equals 4 pi squared. We had r cubed before. Now we're going to have a cubed for an elliptical orbit over gm1. And when we take this ratio, t squared over r cubed, or t squared over a cubed, we're going to get something close to about 3 times 10 to the minus 19 centimeters, or second squared per meter cubed. That's known as Kepler's constant. So, Kepler's three laws of planetary motion. Let's go a little deeper into our analysis now. Let's take a look at the total mechanical energy for an elliptical orbit. And we're just going to look at this one very briefly, not in quite as much depth as we did before. Again, the total mechanical energy is kinetic plus potential. And we said before that would be 1 half m2 v squared minus g m1 m2 over r. Now, however, because it's an ellipse, when we take and do all our math here, what we're going to find is that the total mechanical energy is going to be minus g m1 m2 over 2a as opposed to 2r. Total mechanical energy for an elliptical orbit. Likewise, we can look at the velocity and radius for an elliptical orbit. And this is an interesting analysis because we can go back to conservation of angular momentum. If we're looking at mass 2 traveling through here, and we're going to look at it at two different points. Say we're going to look at it at point a and point b. First thing to note is if we take a look at the change in the angular momentum with respect to point P, with respect to time, the rate of change of that time, that's going to be the net torque. But in this case, we don't really have any net torque because the force is always going to go back through that axis. Torque is zero. If there's no torque, there's no change in the angular momentum. Therefore, the angular momentum about point P must be conserved. It's got to be the same. So if we look at this, the magnitude of the angular momentum about point P, and let's look at it, say, here at point B versus at point A, that's going to be m2 times the velocity at A times the radius to A times the sine of theta when we're at A. Oops, over here at A. And if we do the same thing at B, it, since it must be the same, m2 velocity at b, rb sine theta b must all be the same. But note that the angles theta at a and b have to be the same, right? They have to be 90 degrees because we've got a tangential velocity to that radius. If those are 90 degrees, sine 90 degrees is one here and here, those angle dependencies go away, and by the way, Mass 2 can be divided out of both sides. So we can then state that the velocity at A times the radius at A must equal the velocity at B times the radius B. All right. 
Let's take a look at one last application as we look at orbits. We have a rocket that's launched vertically from the surface of the Earth with an initial velocity of 10 kilometers per second. What maximum height does it reach, neglecting air resistance? And it tells us the mass of the Earth and the radius of the Earth, but we can't assume that acceler acceleration due to gravity is constant because we have such a changing distance from the center of the Earth, we're going to have a changing gravitational field. So let's solve this one by taking a look at conservation of energy. If we do this, we have to note that at the surface of the Earth, the kinetic plus the potential energy has to equal the kinetic plus the potential when it's way above the Earth. So I would start this analysis by writing that the initial kinetic energy plus the initial potential energy has to equal the final kinetic plus the final potential energy. Or at the surface of the Earth, that's 1 half m2 v squared plus the potential energy at 1 Earth radii, negative g m1 m2 over the radius of the Earth has to equal the final kinetic. Well, at its highest point, the velocity is 0, so the kinetic is 0. So that has to be equal the final potential energy. That's going to be minus g m1 m2 over r, whatever that maximum radius is. So now let's do a little bit of math and see if we can't solve for v. Pardon me, we're going to solve for r. I stated that incorrectly. So as we solve for r, we could say that v squared, if I multiply by 2 over m2, we can cancel out all these m2s, multiply that by 2, that by 2, that by 2, v squared minus 2 g m1 over radius of the earth must equal minus 2 g m1 over r. Or a little bit more rearrangement, 1 over r therefore equals minus v squared over 2g m1 plus 2g m1 over 2g m1 re. Or continuing our simplification, 1 over r equals minus v squared over 2g m1. Well, over here on the right hand side, 2's cancel out, g's cancel out, m1's cancel out. I just have plus 1 over radius of the earth. All right, so 1 over r. Now I can start to substitute in my values. I've got minus v squared, so that's going to be minus 10 kilometers per second, that's 10,000 meters per second squared over 2g m1, that's 2 times g is 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 newton meters squared per kilogram squared times the mass of the earth, 6 times 10 to the 24th kilograms plus 1 over the radius of the earth. Well, the radius of the Earth is about 6.37 times 10 to the 6th meters. Go through the math there, solve for r, and I find out then that r is equal to about 3.12 times 10 to the 7 meters. So that's the maximum distance from the center of the Earth that our rocket reaches. But we want the height above the surface of the Earth. So then the height is going to be r minus the radius of the Earth, which is going to be about 3.12 times 10 to the 7 meters minus radius of the Earth, we said, 6.37 times 10 to the 6th meters. I'll leave that one for you guys to finish up. Hopefully that gets you started with orbits. If you need more help looking for more information, check out aplusphysics.com. Thanks and make it a great day.